Friday right year 10s and perhaps year 11s. Um, just assuming before we start going through this poem that um, that you've already seen the context video that I did and that you're aware of some of the imperialism of European nations and what Eurocentric means and some of the black history that I spoke about um, like Toussaint Louverture, Nanny of the Maroons, Mary Seacole, etc. Um, if you need any more help on those, then you'll find it on OneNote. Um, so to start with checking up my history, just really quickly, I'm just going to read through the poem um, and then sort of think aloud afterwards and maybe get some good annotations down, which can help with further revision of the poem. So just quickly to read it. Um, check them history. Them tell me. Them tell me what them want to tell me. Bandage up me eye with me own history. Blind me to me own identity. Them tell me about 1066 and all that. Them tell me about Dick Whittington and he cat. But Toussaint Louverture? No, them never tell me about that. Toussaint, a slave. With vision, lick back Napoleon Battalion and first Black Republic born. Toussaint the thorn to the French, Toussaint the beacon of the Haitian Revolution. Them tell me about the man who discovered the balloon and the cow who jump over the moon. Them tell me about the dish that ran away with the spoon. But them never tell me about Nanny, the maroon. Nanny, seafire woman of mountain dream, fire woman, struggle hopeful stream to Freedom River. Them tell me about Lord Nelson and Waterloo, but them never tell me about Shaka, the great Zulu. Them tell me about Columbus in 1492, but what happened to the Caribs and the Arawaks too? Them tell me about Florence Nightingale and She Lamp and how Robin Hood used to camp. Them tell me about old King Cole was a merry old soul, but them never tell me about Mary Seacole from Jamaica. She travelled far, to the Crimean War. She volunteered to go, and even when the British said no, she still braved the Russian snow. A healing star among the wounded, a yellow sunrise to the dying. Them tell me, them tell me what them want to tell me. But now I checking out my own history, I carving out my own identity. So it's um it's a beautiful poem, and clearly this is a speaker. Remember, poems never have narrators. Poems have speakers. And this is a speaker who has clearly learnt a lot at school, and some of it is worthy, some of it isn't, and some things weren't taught at all. So I'm going to start just quickly by putting a kind of key up here. Um, and I'm going to say... Up here, things, maybe you could be writing something similar down. So things, the speaker was taught, or rather told, because um, there is a fine difference between tell and teach. Um, things the speaker was taught, um, and things that were not and just using a couple of highlighters here I'm just going to highlight the things that the speaker was taught in blue so let's just look quickly at this um, so they tell me what they want to tell me I was told what I what they wanted me to know basically um, so they told me about 1066 and all that this is the Battle of Hastings very European history then tell me about Dick Whittington and He Cat nursery rhymes. They didn't tell me about Toussaint Louverture. I'll we'll come back to that later. Um, what else did they tell me about? They told me about um, the man who discovered the balloon. And they told me about the cow who jumped over the moon. They told me about the dish that ran away with the spoon. Um, and what else did they tell me? They told me about Lord Nelson. They told me about Waterloo. Um, they told me about Columbus in 1492, um, Florence Nightingale they told me about, and She Lamp. They told me about Robin Hood and how he used to camp. They told me that old King Cole was a merry old soul. Um, they tell me what they want to tell me. So we've got here a sense of, um, you know, what John Agard's speaker 
was told. And what we can say that it's all got in common, um, it's pretty obvious really, um, is either white history and nursery rhymes. Also white nursery rhymes, I must add. Um, and in another colour, things that weren't taught, things that were concealed, things that maybe should have been taught and were held back from the curriculum. Remember that John Agard himself went to school in Guyana where they had a white curriculum left behind by the British and this is the legacy of it. So things that he wasn't taught. Toussaint Louverture. No, they didn't tell me about that. Um, and they didn't tell me about Nanny, the Maroons, the Windward people. They didn't tell me about Shaka, the great Zulu. What about the Caribs, the native people of the Caribbean and the Arawaks too? And they never told me about Mary Seacole, um, another black figure from history that you will already be familiar with. So it's interesting that um, things that were not taught, we can say, is black history. Um, so we've got this sense that there's um, a colour to history. There is a division between black and white in this poem. So I'm zooming in a little bit and we can start and do some annotations here. And beginning with um, them tell me, them tell me. So we've got here um, I guess pairs of pronouns. So I'm just going to put like a little box around that. Um, maybe I could just I could put little arrows up, and I can write here repeated pronouns. Um, and these actually are significant. It's all very well like identifying a feature. That's great. But actually, I need to explain the significance. And I'll try and do that all the way through. That these repeated pronouns create an immediate sense of division. Um, between them and me, the speaker, that there is no, there's no us in this poem. This is something that is about division. This is a poem about um, black and white. Them is the white masters of the curriculum, and me is the speaker who has had to live through this throughout school and culture and having to um, learn a version of history that might not be the most relevant for me. Um, now also interestingly from these first words we have to acknowledge that um, there is the use of phonetic language. That John Agard uses um, a, a creole, which is um, a stable kind of mixture of English and um, Caribbean English and Jamaican. And it leads to some quite interesting um, creole phrases throughout. So um, let's think of the significance of this phonetic language, because, you know, um, I think we can all acknowledge that it forces us to engage with this variety of English. Let's write that, that it forces readers to engage with um, Euro centricity. We have to understand that actually um, by being made to speak like this when we read this poem aloud, we are having to accept that Euro, um, that sorry, the English languages we would have standard, uh, standard English 
isn't exactly the only way to get meaning across. We have to acknowledge that, that meaning still comes across very well without the standard punctuation and so on, um, and pronunciation and spelling. So it forces us to acknowledge this. Um, interesting, this next line here, this little couplet, bandage up my eye to my own history. Um, that this metaphor kind of makes us think of, um, I don't know, maybe draw a picture. Maybe it's easier to explain with a picture as I have. Um, I don't know, like this guy here. And I'm imagining that he is the speaker and There he is, looking rather shocked. That's him. That's the speaker, right? And usually, right in front of him, living where he does, would be this thing. Just, just uh, be really clear here. Make it nice and large, because really, it is large. Um, bit of a long-winded way to do it, perhaps, but. There it is, black history, right in front of him. Um, and he, in ordinary circumstances, would be able to see it. There are those sort of cartoon things showing that his eyes um, would be the things that would see it. So therefore he would learn about it. But actually, um, this metaphor bandaged up my eye with my own history. Let me just put a little... Um, box around that bandaged it bandaged up my eye this this metaphor um i'm just going to write this metaphor defamiliarizes um eurocentric it defamiliarizes um, Eurocentric education. It makes it strange, um, and it forces readers to reimagine it ironically as something healing. Um, so, defamiliarizes Eurocentric education and forces readers to see it as something healing, like a bandage, um, which is ironic, because actually it's done to conceal the real history. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tear a little bit of this um, page off that can act as like a little bandage to go over his eyes. In fact, I'm just going to glue that on, because it was solidly fixed throughout the whole of European occupation of so many nations. So I'm going to get my glue and pretty much I just bandage up his eye to his own history. There it is, it's on, right? So just fill in these gaps. And when you think about bandages, um, they are white. Um, and so we're kind of. Um, going to see this throughout the poem where white history is pretty much um, enforced upon the speaker so it's kind of interesting and he ends up being blinded to his own identity because his own identity is mixed in with his um, culture and his black history so it's really important um, Anyway, then tell me about 1066 and all that. So this is a, a reference to the Battle of Hastings. And it's quite interesting that we have this dismissive phrase here and all that. So dismissive phrase. Um, and actually, it's, it, you can imagine a gesture going with it. And tell me about 1066 and all that. Um, I imagine it being said with a gesture of dismissiveness and being, being um, somewhat of a soggy tissue that you throw in the bin. Um, and what it really does is it 
trivializes. Here we're looking very much at English history. I'm telling you about Dick Whittington and Hecat. So we're aligning that English history with something um, childlike. You know, um, Dick Whittington and Hecat as a nursery rhyme. I know that Dick Whittington was also the mayor of London at once upon a time, but actually the presentation here is one of a nursery rhyme. And it's been aligned with, um, you know, an important day in English history. So to be critical of um, the speaker here, you might argue that this is um, trivialization of something important, you know, and that should be taught. You know, it's important to not just passively accept stuff. Um, but actually, the point that he is trying to make is the same one that I've just made, that passively accepting stuff um, is a way to condition um, identities. Anyway, then we have um, Toussaint Louverture introduced. No, he says, they never tell me about that. Um, and Toussaint, we have this um, celebratory kind of chant-like indented italicized stanza that has has much shorter lines and they're almost um incantations these two song a slave with vision lick back napoleon battalion this is celebrating i love the um the spondee at the beginning there that this spondaic introduction in a single line <laughs> um, enhances and celebrates black history. This historical figure is celebrated right from the beginning. Um, and interesting, I like this lick back. Um, this lick back is a Creole phrase and it means defeat which is exactly what um, Toussaint Louverture did with the Napoleon Battalion um, and that is what led to the first black republic being born. Um, Toussaint was actually or is here described as a thorn to the French um, and so we have this um, I don't know I'll draw a little picture let's just a little, put a little box around that and you know I imagine um, thorns that look like this and they come off of um, rose bushes and other bushes and thorns are um, prickly and annoying but actually they're natural we're thinking in here that they're natural so I'm going to write um, that the thorn The thorn metaphor creates a natural and we're going to see this throughout actually but it creates um, a natural obstacle for the oppressive French and maybe behind this I could have um, the French flag and it's red, white and blue, I don't have any colours but basically it is being snagged upon this thorn of sort of like maybe I should colour it in like that colour um, and basically it's a natural thing, this is something that is a, a natural obstacle and it is also goes on to say um, that Tucson is also a beacon. This is another interesting metaphor. When I think of a beacon, I can't help but think of something, um, a bit of a rubbishy picture here, but let's draw like a little rocky outcrop in the sea. And on this rocky outcrop, if I draw very, very quickly, um, one of those which is a lighthouse a beacon quite literally a beacon of Tucson is described here as the beacon so the beacon 
metaphor. So we have a Thor metaphor for Tucson, and also we have a beacon metaphor, um, which forces, let's just go through the significance of it, forces readers to reimagine this black figure. Perhaps I should acknowledge his name there, but I've already written black figure. And the beacon metaphor forces readers to reimagine this black figure as quite obviously bright. Yeah, that's for sure. A beacon is bright, but also a beacon is something that shows the way. It's progressive. It takes us forward. It also illuminates dangers. Um, my writing is getting smaller and smaller, but it illuminates dangers. It reveals hidden truths, which is exactly what Agard is trying to do here. So let's write that too. It reveals hidden truth. And that is that we don't have to be um, oppressed on this island. We can have our own island and we can be in charge of ourselves and be autonomous we don't need the french to be in control of us so we reveal that hidden truth he was a beacon so this use of language as metaphor helps us understand this um, so all this is very french in theme and in terms of the oppressors and then we touch on a little bit of frenchness here then tell me about the man who discovered the balloon um, now you could be critical here um, and say that perhaps that's important history, Mr. Raygard, Mr. Speaker. Um, perhaps that you should have learned about the man who discovered the balloon. But actually, um, the Montgolfier brothers um, is... That is the person, or they are the people who um, invented, rather than discovered, um, the hot air balloon. Um, discovered balloon um, that perhaps we can say that this um, this is justified to have this in the curriculum perhaps not um, but pretty much it's just um, I think anyway um, we kind of criticize the French here and perhaps it's unfair criticism of the French here, or rather trivialization of them because um, we're aligning them with nursery rhymes and cows that jumped over the moon and so on. Um, so moving up to the next stanza, Nanny the Maroon. Okay, so this is an interesting um, woman. I like this Nanny of the Maroon person. She's mythical almost. Um, she is a seafar woman. I love that phrase. Again, that is a Creole phrase. Um, what does that do? I guess it, it articulates um, her foresight that she sees far. Um, let's write that down. Um, did it beautifully articulates Her foresight because she did see further she did help um, you know lead rebellions against European powers and she um, was quite progressive for her time for having done that she taught people how to um, you know fight off white oppression and and I love the way that um, the natural imagery is attached with her here but what I especially like is like um, like the um, thorn and like Toussaint being described as a beacon, Nanny of the Maroons is described as a fire woman. I quite like that. That's a lovely image. Uh, let's think. I'll draw a quick picture of some flames. Rubbishy kind of drawing here, but never mind. They're flames, right? Um, to make it clearer, perhaps I'll draw some logs at the bottom to make it clear that that is a fire. That is a bloody awful fire, but never mind. Um, but fire plus 
woman and let's just do a quick woman here and perhaps I've kind of made it like her hair is on fire as well, but never mind. Um, so fire woman, um, fire, fire woman metaphor. Um, what does this do? This 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 encourages us to accept that she is light, like the beacon, um, and I guess also she is is warm and perhaps even dangerous. So the firewoman metaphor helps readers um, see her as warm as a person and bright but also dangerous which indeed she was to um, to those that um, white oppressive forces that dared to mix with her um, and that was a good job interesting here that we have a um, hopeful stream to freedom river this hope and freedom metaphor here this um, um, I'm going to box both of those in one because they kind of are very connected in terms of streams lead to rivers um, this hopeful and freedom metaphor because you know um, when, when you think of hope and freedom there you know political ideals rather than um, wet things like rivers and streams so this is a, a a sense of imagery and metaphor that we're getting here and and it helps us to understand and recognize that um helps let me write this down readers understand that hope and freedom are natural again but more than that much more than just natural also they have momentum once started that if um, a stream develops and goes further into a river um, they come from a spring like the sea fire woman nanny of the maroon and perhaps it's significant that it doesn't go onto the sea um, because this is a struggle that goes on um, now we have here some eurocentric history we have lord nelson um, and waterloo um, this is very european historical figure Nelson um, and he like the French um, actually in, in a war against the French here was um, somebody who helped develop the British Empire um, he helped control he had the Battle of the Nile for example Lord Nelson um, was a man who who controlled and helped Britain control its overseas territories and this is justified with the education system delivered to John Agard's speaker. It's a European historical figure here, um, perhaps, or taught to perhaps justify the the expansionism of. British Empire um, but interestingly what he wasn't told about is somebody who defended against the expansion of the British Empire so we have juxtaposed here um, so juxtaposed um, with the absence of 
those who defend nations, um, like the Zulu nation, against the British Empire. So what what this speaker was taught about and deliberately not taught about um, helps justify expansionism and imperialism and it also helps conceal the oppression of peoples like the Caribs and the Arawaks and Shaka Ray Zulu. In fact look at how Columbus and 1492 is mentioned because that was the white historical version of the white discovery of an otherwise already populated land. Um, no mention of those native American people who were already there. Later, we are told that they told me about Florence Nightingale and Shelamp, a significant figure, and how Robin Hood used to camp, and told me about Old King Cole was a merry old soul, but they never told me about Mary Seacole. Um, very interesting and important figure, and almost aligned with Florence Nightingale in so many ways, because she went to Crimea too. She um, she helped the, the dying, um, and she was... Um, voted by a BBC documentary several years ago as the greatest black figure um, in in English history because she actually was a naturalised English person once she moved across here. Um, but, you know, not many people have heard of her, especially when compared to Florence Nightingale. This doesn't make her any less important. It just means that she's not taught in history um, and so we have a version a white version of history um, she's described as a healing star i love that um, let's just put that little arrow up there that this again is a metaphor um, and that the healing star metaphor um, like beacon and like fires um, used before for um, Tucson and for Nanny of the Maroons, it helps us think of this black historical figure, let's just write this down, um, helps readers um, consider black history as um, shining like a star, beautiful like a star. Um, actually, you could take this further. Um, the obviously bright like the beacon, like the fire, but also for some. I'm going to write this for some, and then I'm considering um, interpretations, plural, not just one. Also for some, this healing star could make you think of black history as celestial and even divine, heavenly, um, being in the sky. Um, others might think of it as somewhat removed um, and far off, as black history seems to be for many. Um, let's write this down. Consider also um, how remote and isolated stars are. Um, and so this healing star removed from the white curriculum could be um, aligned with a star in the sky, as in totally removed and almost insignificant when um, put against something like the sun. But that leads us on to this yellow sunrise. This is important. Um, so she is also described. Um, so the healing star among the wounded, also a yellow sunrise to the dying. So um, I don't know, let's draw some little mountains and some hills and, you know, a little landscape there, which is a bit rubbish. And behind it, almost Teletubby like, comes the yellow sunrise. I wish I had a yellow felt tip, but yellow sunrise metaphor. 
um, reinforces the ideas of black being bright as it should be. Um, and then on to the last stanza. So we're almost finished um, this little bit, really. Um, them tell me, them tell me what they want to tell me. But now I'm checking out my own history. I'm carving out my identity. And I love this idea, this verb here, carving. Um, I'm just going to put a little box around it. Um, so that's just right here. The verb carving. Um, when you think about carving, it's um, what, what you're actually doing when you're carving something is revealing something that was already there. You actually uncover something that that was um, a pre-existing. You don't add anything. So verb carving um, is interesting. This is a bit of a rubbish annotation, but I, but I think the significance of it is important. Verb carving is interesting and. significant because when something is carved it simply reveals what was already there um, and so this identity was actually always there it just needed to be revealed um, it needed to be carved actively by the speaker um, so I think um, I don't know let me just draw like a, a figure and I imagine that being carved out of a block of marble almost um, and that this identity that was already there this black identity let me write that there black identity is being carved away let me just put this little tool in there this is a chisel um, there's a rubbishy picture but it is a chisel and it's being hammered repeatedly and there's bits flying off everywhere and basically um, we have um, the white being uh, I've written the word white white being carved away to reveal the black identity um, so carving is um, what is happening there in that picture although it's not very good I think the idea is there that it, there's this existing black identity beneath already interestingly we have um, no full stop at the end let me just put a little arrow there in fact the whole thing has no full stop this is a structural thing really um, so we can take two meanings from that um, if I just write here no no full stop. Um, it could either mean that we can see the speaker resisting Eurocentric grammar and punctuation conventions, or perhaps this, or maybe. I'm squeezing this on the bottom here, represents um, how the struggle continues. Um, the, the, why put terminal punctuation or something like um, the struggle against white oppression continues? It's very much an ongoing issue, very much a, a problem that doesn't go away. So um, this is you know these are some of the language features and their significance um, and I guess we need to talk a little bit about structure I've got a little bit of a gap over here so let me just put a little heading here form 
and structure. Now this isn't exactly a recognised form of poetry. It's not like a sonnet or a villanelle or a haiku or anything like that. But we do have some recognised stanza types. We have, um, well, let's have a look. We begin with um, a tercet, a couplet. So, um, introduced with a, a tercet and a couplet um, and then I think it's interesting to look at the rest of it as a whole so we have um, one two three four five quatrains so introduced with a tercet and a couplet um, followed by five quatrains, they are four line stanzas. A stanza with four lines is called a quatrain. So we're followed by five quatrains, um, which are themselves um, interrupted with um, black stanzas. When I say black stanzas, that is because a quatrain is a very white European Wordsworthian um, stanza that represents Eurocentric poetry in a sense um, and acts into this forcefully are short black stanzas that are um, celebratory, short-lined, italicised, relaxed, indented. Let's write some of this down, then we can begin uh, speaking about the significance of the structure. So let's just write this quick sentence, the significance of the um, black celebratory chant like and short line stanzas there's a lot of adjectives there the significance of the black the celebratory the chant like and the short line stanzas um, being axed violently into the traditional, almost Eurocentric quatrains. Um, the significance of this is that it forces readers um, to acknowledge the presence of what's been ignored, really. Let's write that down. To acknowledge the presence of what has been ignored, that is, black history. Um, they're violently axed into this poem. I really like that idea. Um, and essentially, um, this is a political point. That is like about the curriculum and the government control of it, um, uh, somehow keeping out a black history curriculum. Um, and that actually somebody like John Agar can ax it back in there with these stanzas. Um, is a political point. This is a political point delivered with the structural layout. Um, and so what we have is essentially um, a, a poem that ends with somebody that removes this bandage, somebody that takes it off, somebody that has a positive ending and his, is able to realise and um, 
celebrate his own identity at the end. It's quite interesting to compare it with Kamikaze, which has a similar journey of somebody who can um, find their identity, but they end differently. This one ends positively, whereas Kamikaze ends with somebody who um, finds their identity and then doesn't have that um, positive ending, but instead has a negative ending. Um, and just this is like, I mean, let me zoom out and show you. This is, uh, I guess, a reasonable amount of detail for you to be aiming towards for your um, annotations. And I'm hoping that it's helped you and I'm hoping that um, you've got something that looks very much like this too. Um, what you should do, because you're off school at the moment, is um, take a picture of it and put it on OneNote on your homework or Otherwise, take a picture of it and email it to me. Well done, and thank you very much.